Welcome to the Exodus Cry podcast, where we have honest conversations around exploitation, trafficking, sexual culture, and justice. Alan, welcome to the podcast. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. We've been a huge fan of Saving Innocence for a long time. You took over the leadership of Saving Innocence. It was it 2019? Uh, it is sort of a gradual 2017 to 2019. And then um, Kim, the founder, stepped off and went under the board for, for a bit. And so right in there is when it all happened. Okay. Can you talk for our viewers and listeners that don't know about Saving Innocence? Can you talk about what Saving Innocence does? Yeah, we're a 13-year-old anti-trafficking agency based in Los Angeles. Uh, we train and consult around the country when, when asked and invited, but our boots on the ground, if you will, are in LA. And uh, I just mentioned Kim, our founder. She went traveling the world uh, at the decade previous to 2010, saw all forms of abuse and trafficking and human rights violations around the world. And then she came back home to LA, to California, and with her eyes had been opened to what's happening. And it was happening right here in our country, in our city, but nobody was really talking about it. No one really understood it. The language was incorrect, you know, calling 10 year olds prostitutes. I mean, it's just everything upside down from a society standpoint. And so she felt called and led to do something, not just talk about it and started an organization called Saving Innocence. And um, the focus has been, the restoration and the recovery of child victims of sex trafficking has been our main focus. We do some other things too. It's grown into that, but that's the essence of what we've been doing and partnered with law enforcement and all the other stakeholders in the county and on call around the clock and up to our ears in tragedy and, and triumph at the same time. So that's, that's the bulk of what we've been doing. Can you talk about what the situation in Los Angeles is related to this issue of trafficking and child trafficking? Yeah, uh, Los Angeles is the leader in most all stats, both good and bad, because there's so many people here. It's a, one of the entertainment capitals of the world, and there's a million sports teams and conventions and all the things that are happening. And so the exploitation and trafficking follows uh, where most of the customers are. So um, the, the exploitation and the trafficking has been horrific, as it is in every location. There's just more of it here than in most places because there are so many people. The good side of that, of, of where we are in LA, is that there is and has been a phenomenal partnership with the law enforcement agencies, and that was a slow build. Uh, it was There wasn't much of a partnership when we started in 2010, but um, there's a really unique model here with the DCFS, the probation department, the law enforcement entities, organizations like Saving Innocence, we're all at the table um, pursuing these kids mostly and, and uh, getting what they need. And so while it's hard and ugly and dark, there's also a lot of really great people working hard around the clock to solve it. So some people, you know, when we talk about the idea of child trafficking, yeah. their mind goes to places like Southeast Asia they don't immediately connect child trafficking with a prominent city like Los Angeles here in the United States. So what does that look like in LA? Because I think for most people, they go, oh no, I've been to LA, I've never seen any children being trafficked. So where, where is that happening? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and that's the big aha. And it was for me. I, I came to Saving Innocence eight years ago, and I'd been in, working another direction on behalf of kids and a different nonprofit, not trafficking specifically. And I started hearing about child trafficking. And my first thought was, what, Thailand? What do you mean? And, and that's been part of the problem why this issue, this crime has proliferated, proliferated into this massive problem because most people just don't understand it. And it's hard to see by the naked eye. So uh, there's certainly some common tracks, you know, um, streets in Los Angeles that are filled with all ages, but a lot of, a lot of minors. In fact, um, with our task force that we co-lead, we ran a sting operation uh, about two months ago based uh, in the Inglewood area. 
And when it was all over at about midnight, myself and a board member and another staff member, uh, we drove down one of these common, commonly known tracks. And it was appalling. I'd been there before, but it's been a little while. How many girls were literally out on the street? I mean, it looked like Disneyland in July or something. It was, it was absolutely horrifying. And we know academically, we know this is happening and we've certainly have helped recover and restore some of these victims along the way. But to see it in such vast numbers right in our streets and a friend of mine, one of our board members, he was just speechless in the back seat. He's always, is this, a, are we in America still? Like what, what's happening? There's just this um, tragic turn of events that is happening in our midst. There's some misunderstanding of the crime. The crime itself isn't slowing down. And, and part of the problem, in my opinion, is that in certain cities and certain states, depending where you live, there's a particular approach on law enforcement. And should we have more or better or maybe less or none at all? And somewhere on that spectrum, there are towns that are struggling to enforce the laws on the books. Then you also have certain maybe district attorneys or governors or mayors that also have a particular approach and they might think that they are trying to help a certain group of people but they're actually harming the population that we serve because laws are being dismantled which are tools in the toolbox of the law enforcement on the street to help detain and remove certain criminal elements related to this crime that's a lot i don't know how much detail you want to go into that but that in conjunction with uh, you know, the, the flood of unaccompanied minors coming over the, the border of our country, the streets are filling up. And if something doesn't change soon, I'm expecting a tsunami to hit our country, to hit our city, this city, not to mention other major crime uh, centers around the country. So it is happening on the streets and this crime is happening without penalty largely effectively depending on which city you live in and so we see traffickers bringing in their their property uh the girls that they're exploiting we see them coming into la out of out of county out of the state because it's so uh the environment is so friendly to what they're trying to do now having said that yes it's on the streets for sure depending on where you go. Uh, you know, as you know, technology has just thrown jet fuel on a bonfire. So uh, there's ex exploitation and trafficking happening all the time, every minute of every day online. I saw a recent stat that the FBI estimated there was 900,000 predators online at any given time. And actually that stat's not even that recent. Uh, so I don't know what the real number is now. The pandemic put everybody online put everybody largely unaccompanied children on their smartphones in their computers while nobody was allowed to go outside and, and do anything for a couple of years and uh there's an infestation of predators online so it, it's it's a big mess honestly so in los angeles these tracks there are underage predominantly females who are being turned out and uh, where are they coming from? The, per, like, where are they mostly indigenous to LA? Are they mostly from Mexico and South America? Are they from different states? How would you describe the demographic of people who you guys are seeing they're being trafficked on the streets of LA? The majority that we see are US born American citizens coming right here from Los Angeles. Some 80% or so are already in the foster care program by the time we meet them. They've already been put in the foster care program. They've already been neglected and abused long before the trafficker ever entered their picture. They were groomed and, and um, manipulated in such a way by their circumstances that made them vulnerable to predators with bad intentions. So the, the traffickers in LA and other similar cities don't need to spend a lot of effort or expense or risk bringing people in from other places because the communities that we live in are full of vulnerable minors 
the foster care is overrun. Some 40 or 50,000 children in foster care. Um, society is broken about a million different ways which cause this crime to happen. We, now we do see, um, you know, some uh, people that are being brought in from across the country, other countries. We, we co-lead the task force in LA, which by definition embraces all forms of trafficking, labor trafficking and adult trafficking. That's the part that we've added to what we do uh, over these last couple of years. And so we are partnered with the FBI, with Homeland Security, United States Attorney's Office, and so because of those partnerships, we're being brought into uh, lots of adults and minors that are being trafficked in from other places, other countries. Uh, we know of some locations around L.A. right now that um, are full of vulnerable people from South America, from the Far East, and as we speak, I'm being careful what I say here. I know this is going to air afterwards. There's about to be a pretty big bust to liberate dozens of people that are being held against their will uh, from another country right here in the United States of America. And there's, uh, it's just heartbreaking, honestly. So can you talk about the trajectory of someone who you would say is like a more common trafficking case that you guys are observing in Los Angeles. Um, that trajectory, that trajectory of growing up into what foster care and then where, how do they get there? How do they end up on the streets? What does that look like? And maybe if there's a story or two you can share that kind of illuminates or embodies that reality, that could be helpful. The majority of the kids that we've taken care of uh, are coming from situations of poverty. They're coming from um, violent neighborhoods. They oftentimes don't know, know, who, know who their dad is. He's not in the picture. Uh, oftentimes they've been abused, sexually abused oftentimes. They've been treated as a sexual object from the age of two or three years old. They've been wounded and um, abused in that way. Somewhere along the line, they either ran away from home as a 10 year old because it was so bad or somehow the system got involved and put them over in the foster care system or some group home to protect them. And most foster situations and most group homes aren't prepared for the kind of trauma and abuse that these children have been through. So these kids aren't getting what they what they need typically. So now that 10 11, 12 year old. One of my favorite people in the world was on our staff for a while. Um, this was her story. And at 11 years old, she ran away from home. She had experienced a rape at home by someone close to her and no one did anything or listened to her. She ran away and guess who's ready to provide a soft landing and uh, meet her, her needs, her, uh, food and lodging, housing, clothing, and one of these predators. And before she knew it, she was being trafficked from age 11 to 15 right here on the streets of Los Angeles until she was finally able to get out. And in her words, she said, she's gone on the record many times on videos and public speaking. She said, I was raped between seven and 15 times a night for all those years. And, and that's the typical story. That's a typical story. They've been abused and neglected and uh, discarded and demeaned and dehumanized from the age two, three, four, five, six. That sent them down a certain path and a particular view of themselves and of the world, a particular view of what they should expect and what they can expect from largely men in their lives. Certainly there are some women that, that uh, were participated in that abuse, but predominantly it's men. And, um, you know, we've heard over and over again a lot of these uh, minors, children turning young adults on the way out have said some version of, I thought that's all I could ever do. I, I thought this is what I was supposed to do. This is what I was born to do. If, if you're lied to 
so many times in so many ways reinforcing the same message at some point the human spirit especially a young human spirit begins to think that's the truth and that's the reality and so it's so much more than just pulling somebody out helping somebody get out of their circumstances there's years and years and years of abuse neglect brainwashing manipulation sort of peeling away unpeeling those scales one at a time sometimes somebody might be might be uh, prone to think um well you pulled them out good that's great well yeah but they ran back what do you mean they ran back and somehow there there's something wrong with that kid or the organization that's trying to take care of them well you got to understand that their life experiences have told them that they belong in this other location they've been threatened by their trafficker if you if we ever get parted ways that you got to come back to us immediately you must um and in some way shape or form i've heard this too there's an interesting phenomenon that's happening there and some educated psychologist probably has a name for it but there's an interesting phenomenon that 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 a human can begin to manage and say I'll take the known abuse over here. I can somehow manage it. I can define it. I can see it. And, and that is more attractive than say running away into something that's unknown. I, I would rather be abused and, uh, you know, perpetrated on by people that I know in a situation that I know than by strangers out there. Like it could be worse out there. Then so I'm going to stay a situation right that I don't know. That's right. So it's uh, how, how does the human spirit get to that place? And what as a society, how are we allowing this to happen? For a number of years, we had a little seven-year-old that we were entrusted with right here, not far from where we're recording right now. She grew up uh, sold by her own dad from age zero to three, uh, trafficked from four to seven. And then we entered into a relationship with her. We're with her for about four years. You think, how, how, how does this happen? Yeah, right. How are the adults in the room that should be entrusted with public safety allow us to even venture into a gray area of exploitation and trafficking and abuse it's uh it's ridiculous and heartbreaking so there are children out there who are growing up in abusive situations many of these children either end up on the street or in foster care. And then from there are being preyed upon. Their, their vulnerability is being preyed upon. How big of a problem is that? In other words, in a city like Los Angeles, are there 20 people a, a year that end up in that situation where their home life is, is so distressed and so abusive and so volatile that they just can't be at that home in their home anymore. And they either run or are taken by, um, taken into foster care. Uh, how many are there? Are there a hundred or a thousand? Are there are a thousand. How, what kind of numbers are we talking about when we talk about kids whose home life is so distressed that they end up in another context, either on the street or in foster yeah. care? Uh, as I mentioned earlier, I don't quote me on the exact number, but in foster care in Los Angeles, I think there's some 50,000 kids in foster care, which by definition means their home life was abusive, neglectful, traumatizing. Uh, we did some work with the LA city a couple of years ago in a campaign and, and they had determined that there were uh, as many as 10,000 minors being trafficked in Los Angeles at any given time. Um, we partnered and, and did some training in the state of Texas a few years ago, and 
they had determined with their metrics that there were some 90,000 in the state of Texas, minors being trafficked. So the people that count things will typically quote some 300,000 children being trafficked at any given time in our country. It, it's, a, it's a hard crime to quantify exactly. Like we know exactly how many bank robberies there were. There's a physical location. They, 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 the money's not there anymore. Like we know when it happened, there's probably some kind of evidence. This is all happening in the shadows, in the darkness, off the grid. And so um, it's best estimates. At Saving Innocence, you know, we've um, walked closely with, helped to restore uh, around 2,000 children since we've been around. And that's really, the majority of those came from 2015 or 16 until present. So what's that number? I don't know what that number is. It's way too many, that's for sure. The reason why I ask that question is to say, you know, how do we help this situation from the standpoint of intercepting those children and providing them with the kind of therapy, the kind of support, the kind of care, housing, um, et cetera, that they need to avoid ending up in the hands of a trafficker? Would you, would you say that that's where a lot of the work lies in this is? Well, there's certainly enough to do with that. You know, there, there's the, how do we intervene in the crime that's happening or take care of that, the wounded child? I, I want to spend my time and energy as much as I can doing that. But then whenever I can have other conversations or come and have a conversation with someone like you, um, I don't want to oversimplify what could be a complex issue. But in all humility, I think I know the answer to, to wiping out trafficking. And it, it comes in life when you, when you diagnose and when you can isolate and define what a problem is, whether it's something with your body, they take an x-ray or an MRI or something, or you know your car is making a funny sound, the mechanic knows, he can fix it. If you know what's wrong, then you can usually fix it, or at mm -hmm. least have a chance. Right. Well, the, the problem is men. It's undoubtedly men. It's by far the most buyers are men, the most sellers are men. If there's a single household, it's almost always the man who's not there. If there's a war around the world, it's usually a man leading those, those troops and an exploitation, it's usually men. So uh, I'm not saying that's an easy fix. I'm saying we know what the problem is. And so if we can get enough men to live in their authentic, true, helpful, positive self of what they should be of honoring and respecting women and children and, and taking care of their responsibilities, then we're going to see human trafficking and everything else decline. I saw a little meme not long ago. I don't know if it was a joke or an actual study, but it said 80% of all problems uh, are caused by men. And I sort of laughed for a second. I thought, wait, that's probably true. It might be a little low, actually. So if we can get if, if we can get enough men, I don't know what the tipping point is, being strong members in their household, in their community, in their neighborhood, in their city, in their town, we're going to see things uh, decline. Because if a guy's hanging out with his buddies on a Friday night or any night, and suddenly somebody wants to go to the strip club or do whatever they're going to do, the good strong man's going to step up out of relationship and say, we're not doing that tonight. Well, why not? Because I'm not going to let us. And here's why. Most of the women you're going to see in there don't want to be there. They'd rather be somewhere else. We're not going to go pay money and watch them be abused. We're not doing that. That's not what we're doing. And so um, now having said that, there's, we, have to, we have to get an effort to turn men around in general. And then we also have to put more energy into all the other ways that we could put energy into. We have to have stronger laws, stronger punishments for the perpetrators, more resources into technology to help stop the crime for the cyber crimes that are happening. There's so many ways, but it starts with us as a society saying enough, no more. And there's enough smart people out there. There's enough resources out there where we can do whatever we want to do. So what are we doing guys? Like, what are we doing? I, I think that people don't take this crime seriously because they don't take it personally. 
And while I don't want this crime to happen to one more person, sadly, I think what's going to have to happen is that someone close to the decision makers and the lawmakers are going to have to stumble down this path and be exploited and trafficked. And then finally they'll see it. And then finally they'll take it seriously because they will be taking it personally. Just to the regular person out there walking around, you can't think of anything worse than my dear friend who I mentioned a second ago saying, I was raped 7 to 15 times every single day for five years. Like if you do that math, it's preposterous. You can't think of anything worse happening to your child or your grandchild. But because it's largely invisible, people aren't taking it seriously. Sure, we need the multimedia, we need the social media campaigns. We need good, strong men and women to rise up and confront the predators. It's predatory behavior. You know, we've all seen those little clips of the National Geographic and whatnot, and you see a lion laying down in the tall grass, downwind, there's a strategy, and that herd of antelope or something comes running by. In that video, you never see that lion jumping on that first strong, confident, big leader of the pack. He's always waiting for that little one to get lost. A little run falls behind. He jumps on that one. So we need moms and dads and again my target audience tends to be men because they're the ones that are absent most often we don't want it to happen to anyone else but let's start at home let's make sure your kids the kids that are in your family in your neighborhood are strong confident and aware let's not have them be weak timid and unaware let's have them be strong confident and aware age appropriately they understand what's happening so that we can prevent the crime from ever happening and then see how many good strong men and families you can get to walk with you on that. Most kids have been exposed to pornography by age 13. Some are addicted even as young as six. So how is pornography shaping the lives of impressionable children and adolescents? Our documentary, Raised on Porn, exposes the ways pornography has become the new sex education for children and unpacks the dangerous lifelong implications of this global phenomenon. I was like, this is my chance of actually getting pornography for myself. The film features real stories of childhood exposure paired with experts who weigh in on the reality children are facing. It's absolutely impossible for them to resist this kind of stimulus. It's already garnered millions of views and 93% of viewers polled said it inspired them to be more proactive in protecting their children from porn. You can watch Raised on Porn for free on YouTube or go to raisedonporn.com. Why do you think so many men are participating in the, the sex industry in buying women and children or on the trafficking side, selling women and children. What do you think is happening um, on a societal scale that is producing so many men who are willing to buy a woman or child for sex? I, I see a generational curse that's happening that started a long time ago, I think. And little boys are growing up. And uh, for this particular piece of the pie chart, dad's not around often. He's somewhere else. Uh, mom's trying to keep it together, probably working two jobs. As great as mom is and as needed as mom is, she's not a, not a man. That little boy needs, a, needs a, a male to show him parts of life, certain parts of it. And so that continues down that path. Um, at, at some point, pornography oftentimes enters the picture. They say the average age of first exposure is eight or nine years old at this point. And so now this young brain is being conditioned and taught on how to view the world, how to view himself in the world. Then the popular music, the hip hop, the rap music comes on. I gotta be honest with you, a couple of years ago, the Super Bowl was in Los Angeles and we had just come from a memorial service for about 10 of our kids that lost their lives, saving innocence. And at the same time, just after that had happened, I saw my phone buzzed and 
they announced the Super Bowl halftime show. And I almost threw up in my mouth because the people that were in that show have made a career at celebrating the abuse of women and the degradation of sex. And one is rumored to have been a former trafficker. And I said, really? The biggest music gig in the world? And these are the people we're putting on the stage? So what are the 10, 12-year-old little boys and little girls supposed to think? Our society seems to be celebrating sexual abuse. Right. At the very least, if we're not actively celebrating it, no one seems to be speaking out against it. You know, so we, ha we have a, usually have a little gathering at our house for the Super Bowl. And I told the friends are coming over, I said, just so you know, we're turning the TV off during halftime. I'm staging my own little protest. The NFL is still reeling, I'm sure, because of the blow that I struck to their marketing because I turned off my TV in my house. I don't care. It was just the point of it. And so if we can get enough people standing up in small ways and big ways, we might be able to turn this tide around. But you got these little boys and little girls are being conditioned by society. What's causing it? I, I don't know. Um, uh, the sin and the brokenness of the world is causing it. And in our country, we typically have extra resources. We typically have enough money to do whatever we want. A lot of, a lot of people do. There's narcissism. There's greed. There's addiction. We have access to anything and everything, typically. And so for someone who's traveling down that path, uh, it's not hard to become addicted to pornography, to sexual influences. And one step, you know, as you know, within any addiction, it takes a little bit more to satisfy that, get that same high. And when someone's struggling with that particular addiction, it's not good enough to look at your computer. Now you got to go somewhere, pay an entry fee, buy a ticket and see it on live on stage. And then for some people, that's not enough, still not enough. Uh, somebody's approached me maybe in that strip club, said I could have, I could bring her to you for the night. Would you like to do that? And now, wait, I never thought about that. You mean I could physically spend some time in a motel room or the back room or my car with somebody that I paid for? Well, I have money. That sounds like a pretty good deal. And so that the, no one along the way is, is checking that person. The laws aren't checking that person. Uh, many home environments aren't checking that person. We're raising a generation of largely unsupervised and unchecked people that are going down a path of destruction. And they're just modeling what they've seen. You can't even blame a younger person going a direction. This is what he's, he or she has seen. This is, this is what was done to him. It's what's modeled. The older kids in the neighborhood were doing it. It's really disturbing when you're trying to tackle a problem like child sex trafficking or any kind of sex trafficking, adult or child, and then you look out in the pop culture around you and see the people who are celebrating mm -hmm. pimping yeah. and all of that being held up in the culture. For example, well, you mentioned the Super Bowl. I remember when Rolling Stone had a cover um, Snoop Dogg had two girls on leashes and the caption was America's most lovable pimp. Yeah. So we've taken something that is absolutely aberrant, a pimp who preys upon vulnerability of predominantly children, some women, preys upon their vulnerability to exploit them, to sell them to another person for sex and made that person into a lovable pop culture figure. It's so disturbing. There, there's a caricature portrayed in the media, movies of the pimp, just like that. Magazine covers, got some nice car and, you know, some fur coat and just all this. It's like, no, the pimp has probably got a, a black sweatshirt on and, and he's got a cell phone and, and he's got three or four or five girls that he's, threatening with their lives to do exactly what he wants them to do. And he's beating them if they don't. There's a girl that was burned alive on the streets of Los Angeles in broad daylight because she stepped out of line. W one, of the, one of the 
former staff members, a survivor on our team at Saving Innocence told me a story where when she was 13 years old, her and her best friend were being trafficked. The best friend had stepped out of line somehow, some way, broke a rule of some kind. The pimp drove them out into the desert, pulled out a gun and shot her best friend point blank and murdered her right in front of her. And then, okay, so now the girl that was on our staff, do you think she's going to step out of line ever? Nope. The guy thought nothing of just killing a 13-year-old because she broke a rule. No, this is, not a, this is not a caricature. This is not something that we laugh at or celebrate. These are violent, ruthless individuals who are dehumanizing, usually it starts with minors, children, and preying upon their vulnerabilities, and they see them as no more. They're an ATM machine. They see them as a means for dollars. There's eight girls from Venezuela being held right now in a place in Los Angeles. We know this in the process of figuring out the bigger uh, syndicate that they're part of. They're being held in an illicit massage parlor, being forced to work. One of our decoys goes in to try to gain some intel. According to his words, the one girl, they're just absolutely petrified, just scared. And he's trying to reassure her there in the back room. She starts taking her clothes off. I mean, no, 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 no. He stops her. But he saw enough to see big, ugly scars on her body. Not the kind like she got in a car accident. The assessment was it was the kind that you remove a kidney from or maybe insert a bag of drugs from. They're literally, the traffickers are transporting girls from another country across our border and they're using their body, not just making them work and, and service people sexually. We might sell an organ or two along the way if we could make some more money. Or we might insert some cocaine or something in there because you are nothing more than a vessel for my purposes. No, we're not celebrating pimps. Yeah, it's really crazy when you think about that scenario and that picture of things that we make light of that are of such a serious nature and such a serious matter. And I think it, it, it creates the cultural conditions whereby something like this becomes either acceptable or just normalized at a level that we don't take serious action against. So for you and your journey, there came a point in your life where these issues were important enough to you that you decided I'm going to dedicate my entire life to stopping trafficking. How did that happen for you? I, I was going another direction my entire life, 25 years on the Young Life staff. Uh, the last 16 of them were here in Los Angeles. And I, like anyone else, didn't know about trafficking, really. You know, just whatever image I had of some Cambodian village or something like that. Uh, stepped away from that career after 25 years. In the year previously, I had heard about Saving Innocence. One of the, my colleagues said, we should do uh, get Young Life in for Saving Innocence. And I said, what, what do you mean? What's that? Well, they work with child victims of sex trafficking. And I said, the very, I said, what, in Thailand? I didn't understand it. And then we didn't do anything with it. There's nothing, no action step. But then a year later, it was time for me to move on and step back. And as I look back, God was moving the chess pieces in my life and preparing me to step into this space. So I cold called um, Kim, the founder, uh, cold texted her, and um, we connected. And I went to the, to the office, heard the story, you know, heard the two-hour story on a one-hour parking meter. I got a parking ticket. Welcome to, welcome to human trafficking. And, and I was just taken with it all. It was like, and then what? Tell me more about that. You know, it's just, it was all new to me. That part of this story was crazy. And I left that day and I, and I told her, I said, I want to be involved somehow. It wasn't a job interview. There's no job posting. I was just, I wanted to hear more. Could I just meet with you and hear more? And, and I said, I, I'll at least become a little donor for the organization, but uh, I would love to keep talking about this. I have a son and a daughter. Um, and so as, as a dad, you can't think of anything worse happening to your children than being trafficked. 
and as a dad with a daughter, you don't need to be a dad and you don't have, don't have to have a daughter to care about it. But as a dad with a daughter, I was just, my guts were turning, my head was spinning. It's like, I want to be part of the solution. And everything that I had done, experiences that I'd had, people that I knew, it was all felt like it was coming into focus for right here, right now. This is your internship you had for 25 years on the Young Life staff. You're now ready to take your position with Saving Innocence. Um, again, it wasn't a job offer, <laughs> but we continued talking and, and eventually they invited me to come on to the team. Uh, something really confirming happened too. In that next year, there was an awareness event at a church on a Saturday. Uh, Kim, our founder, and another amazing friend who's a survivor were on the stage in a panel. And uh, between them was a woman named Rachel who's a, traf uh, a trafficking survivor. And she's telling her story. And she got to the point where she said, I, I could no longer fight for myself. I needed someone to fight for me. And the hair on the back of my neck stood up. I'll fight for you and you and you and you. I'm going to see how many good people I can get to fight with me. I knew enough to know by then. I was already in. I already been with Saving Us for about a year. I, already, I was already in. I made the decision. And I was, uh, the learning curve was steep, but I knew enough to know that most of uh, the victims are young girls and most of the perpetrators are men. I'm a man. There's almost, almost relatively speaking, there's hardly any men involved in the solution of this fight. I go to some event or some training and it's, it's mostly women and they're great. They're awesome. We, we want all the women there doing what they're doing. They're phenomenal. But the missing ingredient is some good, strong men to be part of the, part of the mixture. And uh, I guess I'm a, a fighter by nature, you know, more in theory than in reality. But um, when she said I needed someone to fight for me, that sealed the deal. And, and then I started getting to know some of these amazing younger survivors and some were coming onto our team, our staff team, started hearing more about their story, building a rapport, a relationship with them. It's like, I, I can't do anything else at this point. My job description might morph and change along the way, but I cannot not be involved in the solution of this crime because I know too much. And yeah, so I'm going to, I'm going to keep fighting for those that need someone to fight for them. In the early days when I was learning about trafficking back in 2007, uh, there was a friend of mine who had a dream and in the dream I was, uh, confronted with this group of girls that were being trafficked and yet they were in proximity to their traffickers so were having to pretend like they were enjoying what they were doing. One of them approached me in the dream and slipped me a letter and I opened it and the letter just said in large red writing, help me. And it really, that dream really gave me an insight into the heart of so many people out there who are in these exploited positions, who are trapped, who are desperate, who are isolated, who are alone, who don't know how or if there's a way out of their situation, but there's a cry in their heart that's saying, help me. So that girl, I need somebody to fight for me. What, what was it, the line that you shared? I, I could no longer fight for myself. I needed someone to fight for me. I needed me. someone to fight for me. The dream I had helped me. There's a demographic of people who exist on our planet that are in exploited positions. And um, it takes a measure of perceptiveness and intentionality and follow through to actually order your life in such a way to go and make a difference in this. And what I appreciate about your story, Alan, and partly I think why I've always felt a connection with you is we were both going in totally different directions with our lives. Like I did not grow up dreaming of being an anti-trafficking advocate. I did not go to the school of abolition of trafficking. Um, my life was headed in a different direction. Your life was headed in a different direction. And yet we discovered this issue. We discovered that, that cry of help me, of I need somebody to fight for me and have made those intentional decisions to order a life in such a way to go make a difference. And 
I think that, you know, having this conversation uh, on our podcast, what's really coming to the surface for me is the importance of the work with men to change the, the, the landscape and the trajectory and the culture of manhood that currently exists on our planet. How do we create a world where men feel loved and respected and women feel valued and safe? How do we create a world where men can use their power, their authority, their intention to make women feel valued and safe? And um, so on that note, you have written this book in partnership with Jessica Midkiff called Men Fight For Me. Yeah. Um, before we wrap up our podcast, can you talk about this book? You and I conversed about it numerous times when you were writing it. And just curious to kind of get your heart behind it and what you would like to see happen. Yeah, no, thanks for bringing that up. And we create a little website around it called fightforme.net. And there's lots of information and resources on fightforme.net. The book's available on Amazon, but you can go to fightforme.net and learn more about it. You, you recognize the fight for me part of the story I just told you. Uh, in that moment when Rachel said, I needed someone to fight for me. Uh, and then I was taking on all this other information and learning about these stories and the fact that I'm a man and most of the problem is caused by men. I have a, I can speak to men in a certain way because I'm, I'm one of you, I'm one of us. And um, so I approached Jessica, uh, one of our amazing friends and survivors and a number of others, some of the names you would recognize in there, Benji. And I approached them and I said, I want to write a book in collaboration with you. I can say things, but you guys need to bring it to life. And um, it focused on men. And they all said, I'm so glad you're writing a book for men. Like it doesn't exist really. And so the heart of it is not man shaming. It's not you all are a bunch of terrible people. It's come on this journey with me. I'm learning. I'm going to bring you along this journey. I'm going to introduce you to some heroes along the way. And um, we're going to get better as a species, as a male species. And so the first maybe half of the book, it's, it's really unpacking the crime, looking at the buyers, the sellers, the, uh, the victims themselves. It, it talks about authentic masculinity. We define what authentic masculinity is as part of that solution. Um, and then in the last couple chapters, there's some, here's some practical things to do. So it's not just awareness. Awareness without action is really kind of useless. So it has to be awareness coupled with action. And there's a very strong and tangible call to action in that book. Here's what you can do. Here's 10 things you can do today. Then here's some macro and some micro. Here's some things we need to get done in society. Here's some things you can look in the mirror. That's the name of one of the chapters, looking in the mirror, talking about our own life, taking stock of how we're leading and living in our family and in our neighborhood. And um, the, the goal is unapologetically the male audience, although a lot of women are reading it and loving it. But, you know, there's there's... A good 50% of the book is me and my male voice challenging men to look at stuff they haven't seen before. And in case there's any proceeds, they're going to the survivors of trafficking that are in the book. And so um, I can unapologetically say, get a case of these books and give them to every man you know, um, because it has been really powerful. I can say that with humility because all the important stuff is said by these amazing survivors and some other people. Thank you for that. I love the challenge that this book presents. Um, and... I'd love for you to elaborate on your idea of what authentic masculinity looks like. The, part of the challenge that I feel like I've come up against is even a willingness on the part of men to be self-reflective. We live in this very polarized cultural climate right now where I think so many men feel um, threatened, feel attacked, feel like their masculinity is under assault. And so there's this reactionary kind of defensive posture about anything that would criticize their way of being in the world. So how do we invite men into this conversation? Because I think like to Tony Porter's point, point, he's the founder of the call to, of a call to men. Most men out there are good men. Right. Um, it's the minority of men who are the perpetrators, but we all have a responsibility. And 
So I think for a lot of guys, it's good enough to be like, well, I'm not buying women. I'm not trafficking women. I'm not part of the problem. Like, what do I need to be self-reflective about? Um, how do we invite the good men to be a part of this conversation? Yeah. And I, I don't let all the good men off the hook in this book. It's like, if you're not actively causing this problem, then you are passively allowing it to happen in our midst. Well, not allowing it to happen. Well, it's happening. So that means we need to step up and take responsibility. If something terrible is happening and we don't do anything to confront it, then we're somehow complicit in that bad thing that's happening. So I'm challenging all men. It's not just the perpetrators. Like don't tune out guys because you know you're not out there buying sex. We need all men to uh, immerse themselves in this challenge. Um, and there's a, there's a narrative out there. There's a poisonous narrative somehow by some voice that's saying any masculinity is therefore toxic masculinity and hurtful masculinity. And, you know, I can see where maybe that, that is coming from because there is a bunch of idiots out there doing bad things and they're visible. So my challenge is no, there's a good, healthy, authentic version of masculinity, not a cheapened, watered down, diminished version that we see played out in media and in or sports heroes and in politics and entertainment. No, there's a good, healthy version. And so um, I, I detail in chapter four of the book, I detail uh, that me, what me and a couple of buddies did with our boys when they were five and six years old, we started a process. And job number one was to define what it is what is the goal of being an authentic, helpful man? And just briefly, uh, one, he accepts responsibility. An authentic man, someone who's practicing authentic masculinity, accepts the responsibilities in front of them and maybe takes responsibility for his larger community. He's going to step in. He's not going to lean back. Two, he leads courageously. He's a courageous leader. It's going to take courage to confront something like this. It's going to take courage to confront your friends who want to go do this, that, or the other thing that's not healthy. We need courageous leaders. That's number two. Three is he lives a life of service. Uh, uh, when a man comes in and he's bringing value add and he's building up instead of tearing down, he's not taking, he's giving, he's living a life of service. That's a, a mark of authentic masculinity. And then the last one is he understands who he is is more important than what he does. He focuses on the internal. Like, we don't care what job you have. Do whatever you do. But who are you internally when no one's looking? Your integrity. So we define that someone practicing those four pillars is practicing authentic masculinity. And if someone's doing that, if we get enough men doing some version of that, there's no room for human trafficking in this world with men doing that. Come on. I love it. Yeah. I love the just having a target yeah. to shoot for something to measure ourselves against. I don't think enough of us men even give thought to what actually substantively, concretely does it look like to pursue the most authentic version of our masculine selves. Um, last question, uh, you know, being a strong male leader in a space that is populated mostly by females, how do you carry yourself as a man to help the women around you feel safe, respected, empowered, all of those things? Uh, honor, serve, and respect and protect women as a way of life. And that's what we're teaching our young boys. So I, I best I can, I want to carry myself in honoring and serving and respecting the women, whether they colleagues of mine at work or neighbors or friends or on social media or in my family. Um, it's, it's, it's honoring and it's serving and it's building up. And to the extent that we as guys can do that, that's going to stand out because we live in a world that's not doing that. I wish the bar was high and hard to get over. It's not. There's a low bar the society and other men out there that are making a lot of noise are setting for what it means to be a good, positive, helpful male. Um, we're going to show up and bring healing, not wounding. Keep things light. Let's have some fun. And let's understand that, in this case, the question is women are valuable, are important, are equal, are at the table. We're not somehow trying to, what's the term, mansplain and stuff. We are trying to collaborate 
by honoring and serving and respecting and protecting. When I have like really honest conversations with women, I'm continually surprised, and I shouldn't be, but I'm continually surprised by how many of them admit to and are honest and transparent about at the end of the day, like, I just don't trust men. Yeah. At the end of the day, I'm going to be honest with you. I'm, I've grown very cynical about men. We're dealing with some stuff in the news right now that's uh, happening with uh, a leader of an anti-trafficking organization and um, all kinds of allegations against him. And those things happen. It casts a shadow on the rest of us and it reinforces the narrative that's already in a lot of women's minds and hearts and life experiences that men can't be trusted. And so I really appreciate the intentionality with which you approach this work. And I think that it's important for us to hold each other accountable in this space to do the things that you're talking about, building professional relationships where the, our colleagues in this space feel valued, feel seen, feel respected, feel safe. Um, it's so important. At Saving Innocence, we have 32 women on staff and four men. And every time a, a man comes, uh, I, I pull him aside. I say, okay, uh, let's see if you can do the job, whatever the job is, your job description, but I don't care about that. You need to understand there's something bigger happening here because all 32 of those women have been inundated with disproportionately high numbers of horrific stories of men. And we have a phenomenal opportunity to begin to change the narrative and begin to model something that's different and healthy. You don't, don't go out of your way, don't make a big deal, but by you just showing up, looking, looking these women in the eye, say please and thank you, and honoring and serving. I, I can't tell you, Benji, how many stories, how many quotes I've heard from women that are coming to Saving Innocence with this, I don't trust men mentality. In fact, it just happened just last week, and they're talking about it being a healing environment they didn't know that it could be uplifting and healing. And um, I, this, this one, one younger guy, you know, 30 something, I mean, good looking guy, you know, great guy. And I said, listen, <laughs> just so you know, if you walk through these doors and these ladies in here get some kind of a vibe, like you're some kind of a cool guy vibe trying to get a date, this will be the shortest employment you've ever had in your life. You'll be out in 30 seconds and it'd be safer for you to go play in the freeway. Like, I just need you to know it's really important because they're all going to look at me like you hired that guy. What's going on? So we have a really important job. Yes, yeah, let's, let's do the job description thing, whatever we have to do for our job. But we have to carry ourselves in a way that honors and serves and builds up. And that's the job within the job. And if we can get more men doing that in whatever their job is, we got a chance at turning society around. It's upside down right now. Yeah. When we think about, you know, this problem and when you really boil it down, this, this problem doesn't happen at the love, you know, there's 42 million people trapped in prostitution around the world. It doesn't happen at that level. It, it's happening. I mean, technically it exists at that level, but it's happening at the level of one man participating in purchasing one woman. And so when you really boil it down to that level, it's how can we, you know, challenge one man to be more self-reflective about his masculine self, about the things he's participating in in his life, and hopefully joining and lending his voice and his efforts to this movement of growing men to stop trafficking in the world. And so thank you for this book, for your work with Saving Innocence. I've been a huge fan of Saving Innocence for a long time. I'm good friends with Kim Biddle, the founder, and um, so uh, thankful for the work that you guys are doing. So thanks for joining us, Alan, and I look forward to continuing um, you know, these interactions with you. It's an honor to be here with you, Benji. I appreciate it. I'm a big fan of you and all that your organization is doing. It's incredible. So thanks for having me. You can check out all our podcast episodes, articles, and films at ExodusCry.com and join the daily conversation by following Exodus Cry on all major social platforms.